this Halloween edition of Lunch and Learn. I'm excited to tell you today about fluorescent spectroscopy. I considered it, but yeah, I left it at home. <laughs> Great, so today we're going to talk a little bit about fluorescent spectroscopy and optical sectioning. And uh, we'll have a little bit of a quick And then, of course, we'll be back in a couple more weeks. Uh, we have some guests coming from, uh, actually not super guests, Luke Bogart used to be in one of our MCD labs here. Uh, he's down with a company called Light Canvas, and they're going to be talking about some tissue clearing equipment they have and some equipment that they have for immune labeling clear tissue, uh, which is something that's brand new. And then we've got some more. Uh, Aaron and Christian are going to take over in November and December. So, like I said, today we're going to talk about how to cut your sample up using the light. What an exciting title. Um, so just a, a quick review, what I kind of tried to do is with the, the talk two weeks ago and then this one, do two parts on the basics of microscopy. So last week we talked mainly about the basics, the guts of a microscope, and we're trending more towards transmitted light imaging. So we didn't dig too much into it. Today we're going to move on to fluorescence and optical sectioning. Um, so all of these points are kind of what we usually cover in our graduate course in January. Um, so we're going to be just touching on these lightly, some of them we're not going to hit at all. But this is just to let you know what you could see if you came to the full-blown um, course in January. If you want some more information about that, please tell us. Cool. So the first thing uh, I want to start with is my son last night asked me what I was doing. I said I was getting a talk ready about glowing things. And he said he wanted to be a part of it. So this is him in his bedroom last night, jumping around and recording himself. And then we turned out the lights. And you can see his little, oh, you can see very well. He's got a little milky way on the roof. The ceiling of his, of his bedroom that I wanted to show you. But then he said the most astonishing thing, I can't hear it because I think I'm going to be turning on the audio, but he said, you know what, Daddy, this is actually phosphorescence. You're probably going to be talking about fluorescence. <laughs> you're totally right. Way to go, buddy. Only in kindergarten. Um, so, what is fluorescence? Fluorescence is shockingly similar to phosphorescence, but it happens a little bit quicker. I'm not going to dig too deep into the details, um, but here is, a, you probably all recognize this as the structure of GFP, green fluorescent protein, uh, something that a lot of us have used. So it's a protein structure, and in the middle in yellow here is a chromophore. So some of the side chains from the amino acids uh, interact with each other and form this, this special chromophore. And the electron cloud around that chromophore is able to accept the photon of cyan or blue light. That's going to come in. That energy from that photon is going to be absorbed into that electron cloud. It's going to hang out there for a little bit. And then eventually, it's going to pop back out as a photon of green light. All right? So this is the idea behind fluorescence. We send in one wavelength of light hangs out there for a few nanoseconds, and then we get another uh, color of light coming back out of it. Right. And that's the way we generally think about it. We always think about it as blue light in, green light out. But it's not entirely true. So on the top here, I have an absorption spectra for GFP, and on the bottom, I have an emission spectrum. So you can see like to get GFP up to that excited state, it's not just cyan light, but we can use to do that. That's the most efficient way to do it, but we can also do it with some purple lights in near UV or some really deep UV light. That's going to bump it up to that excited state. Okay? And similarly, it's not just green light that comes out of that GFP. So it's most likely to be green light based on its emission spectrum here, but you can also get cyan light, yellow light, orange light out of that GFP molecule. Right. So this is something that we always have to keep in mind, and I think we get sort of locked into looking at something like a dye that's called the Luxor 488, and we immediately think, oh, this only gets excited by 488. Or we call something, um, 
the worst one is we call Daffy a blue dye. Daffy is actually a white dye. It emits in the blue, green, and red. Um, so these are things that you always have to keep in the back of your mind when you're doing um, fluorescence microscopy because you can really end up in situations where you have a lot of bleed through between your different channels. If you aren't thinking it about the way you choose your dyes uh, and how you set up the microscope to image them. Okay? So I'm not going to talk to you about why all of this happens, but just let you know that it does. Okay, so if we combine those two graphs, so now we have the absorption spectra kind of in this um, transparent green color on the side, and we've got the emission spectra in the dark green on the right hand side. Um, what you can see is what we call the Stokes shift. So that's what this little arrow is indicating there. But we always have this shift um, from sort of the blue to the red in each of our fluorescent dyes between what they absorb and what they spit back out. And what's really neat is we can kind of draw this line that goes down the middle here, but it allows us to separate what excites our dye from what comes off the dye. Okay? You're going to see that this line is what's really important. It's really the basis of a fluorescence microscope. Okay. First, let's just quickly review what we talked about two weeks ago. So this is that diagram that I showed you of the inside of a microscope in our infinity corrected optics system. Right? So we have two main important components. We have our objective lens, which you're used to seeing. You always see that on the inside of the microscope. And inside the body, what you don't usually see is this tube lens. And so we talked about last week how if you've got three different points in your sample plane, um, the light from these points is collected by your objective, and your sample is sitting exactly at the focal point of this objective. And what that means is that the light that comes from these points in your sam sample plane, once it gets to the other side of your objective, the rays of light coming off of them are traveling parallel to one another, and they're traveling at a certain angle. And that angle that they're traveling at actually encodes the position within your sample. And then once we go through our tube lines, we take those parallel lines and focus them back onto our image plane. And I told you there was something special about this area in here. Does anyone remember what that was called in between the objective and the tube lines? Infinity space, exactly. All right. So this is really great for a couple of reasons. One of these is that our objective can move up and down and focus through different planes in our sample without us having to move the rest of the body of the microscope. The other thing that's really interesting and going to be great for our fluorescence microscope is we can now put a whole bunch of optical components in this area, and it's not going to affect the imaging system of the microscope. Okay. So infinity space is very exciting and very helpful. So one of those optical components that we're going to jam in there in our fluorescence microscope is what's represented by this black line. Okay? So this black line here is showing you uh, a dichroic mirror. And that's what this guy is down here. So it's a little rectangular piece of glass. And on that glass, it has a very special coating. And that coating can reflect some wavelengths of light, but not others. So what you can see is this is um, percent transmission on this axis right here. So you can see that through the near UV, through the blue, through the cyan, we don't get any transmission through that piece of glass. So it's acting like a mirror to those white lines, and they're just reflecting off of it. Okay? So you shoot blue light at this mirror, it just bounces off. But you can see once we get to the other side of this black line, into the greens, the yellows, the reds, um, we now have really good transmission through that glass. So it means that if we shine green light at this piece of glass, it's going to go straight through it. No matter any reflection. All right. So that's called a dichroic mirror. It can reflect some wavelengths of light, let other wavelengths transmit through it. And this is the, really the key component that's going to make our fluorescence microscope a fluorescence microscope. So if we went back to this diagram, let's say we have some a sample with some GFPs. In it. What are the, there's two things that we could change in this diagram to make it into a fluorescence microscope like an image that you get. Any ideas? Uh, 
So let's look at this error right here. This is white light that's coming into our sample right now. What do we need to do there? So we want to change that to some blue light, right? Some cyan light to excite our GFP. And then I was talking about this infinity space here. What could we put in our infinity space that's going to let us see our GFP, but not this blue light that's coming in? Yeah, one of those dichroic mirrors, right? OK. So here now we've got a system where we have cyan light that's going to come in. It's going to hit our GFP on our sample plane. We're going to get some fluorescence. That light's going to go into our objective. And once we get to the dichroic here, it should reflect the cyan light back down onto our sample. And our green fluorescence should go back through to our image plane or our detector. Has anyone ever seen a microscope like that? I can tell you we don't have one like that in the HCBI. Any idea why? So if we go backwards. This transmission of this little mirror here in this cyan range where we're sending in our excitation light for our GFP. It's not zero. It's very small. It's a couple percent. But it's not zero. And what that means is we're sending in this incredibly bright cyan light here. And it's going to go right through. And a few percent of that is going to get through this dichroic mirror and get to our detector. That few percent of the cyan light is probably more intense than the actual green fluorescence we're getting from our GFP. All right? So what you end up seeing on your detector is just mostly this excitation light. You don't see your um, actual fluorescence that you're looking for from your GFP. So in most fluorescence microscopes that you'll see, do not use this what's called transillumination. Okay, so we're not going to transmit our light through our sample. We're going to do something different. So this um, goes by different names. Sometimes this is called wide field fluorescence microscopy. Sometimes it's called epi fluorescence microscopy. Um, but this is, this is epi illumination. So what we're going to do is take our excitation light, and instead of shining it or transmitting it through our sample, we're going to send it in from the side here. We're going to bounce it off this dichroic mirror, and then send it down through our objective. And the way this is set up is there's another optic here that actually focuses this incoming light to the back focal plane of your objective. Okay? It's really hard to find a diagram that actually shows this. That's why I made my own lousy one. Um, but this light actually gets focused to the back focal plane of the objective. And if you focus light to the back focal plane, back focal plane of the objective, when it comes out of the objective, it's collimated. So what that means is we get this nice, straight, even illumination all across our sample plane out of the objective. Okay. So now we've got all of this excitation light that's coming in. It's going to hit our sample plane there, where we have some GFP molecules. And they're going to get lit up. And then they're going to send our light back to our detector. Okay. So. This way, we don't have to worry about so much of that excitation light coming back, because most of it's being directed down into the condenser. Okay. There's still going to be some of it that's going to reflect off of our cover slip or sample uh, and come back, but we can deal with that a lot better um, than we did before. Right. So now I just want to take a quick look at this area right here, what we're actually sticking in infinity space. So it's not just the dichroic mirror. It's a little more complicated than that, but it's not bad. Um, so yeah, like I said, this is called at the illumination. Right. So what we actually have in infinity space is a filter cube. Okay. So inside our filter cube, we have that dichroic mirror that's sitting there. But then we also have two other filters. Okay. One on the side and one on the top. And one of these is an excitation filter, and one of them is an emission filter. The reason for this is 
Uh, in the past, what we were often using as our excitation light, a fluorescence microscope, was a really bright white light lamp. So something like a mercury arc lamp or a xenon lamp. And so we have white light coming into the microscope, and we need to pick off just that cyan light that we need to excite our GFP. So we would put an excitation filter there that, again, is going to reflect all wavelengths of light except those cyan wavelengths that we want to excite our sample. Okay? This isn't as necessary sometimes now because we have LEDs. We can put a number of different LEDs in the system. Uh, and then the LED itself is going to do uh, a good job of dictating what our excitation wavelength is. That said, we usually still plug one of these in front of it. So our excitation light is going to come in. It's going to hit this dichroic mirror. And it's going to reflect down into our sample. Okay. Um, so in this case, this is an upright microscope. So it's coming down into our objective onto our sample. Then we're going to have our fluorescence, which is going to come back up into our objective. It's going to come up. It's going to be at a wavelength that doesn't get reflected by this dichroic mirror. So it's going to keep going straight up. And then what we do is we have an additional emission filter that matches the emission of our chloroform. Okay? And this just does a good job of any of that reflected light, that 1 or 2% that's getting through here, this is going to do an additional job of cleaning that up. Okay? Um, it can also add a band path to it. So often these guys just let everything above a certain cutoff get through. So what the emission filter does is it actually lets us select a band there. So that we're only getting 500 to 550 instead of all the other lights. Right. So what I've done in the graph here is I've just added um, the excitation filter. So that's the blue line here. You can see this is the wavelength that is going to let through to excite our GFP. You can see it matches pretty closely to the absorption profile of GFP. And then the red line here is our emission filter. So those are the three components that make up our filter cube, and that's what's sitting inside that infinity space inside our microscope. So this is just a, a cool diagram off the Zeiss website that lets you see it a little bit better. So this is one of these old school mercury arc lamps that send in our white light. They get to this excitation filter here, which filters out everything except the green light. You can see this lens, this is actually drawn properly, this lens is focusing that light into the back focal plane of the objective. So we're going to get a collimated beam of green light going down onto our sample. Um, we're going to get some fluorescence, this is a red dye. So that red fluorescence is going to pass back up into our objective, go through our dichroic mirror, and up to the other. So that's how a wide field fluorescence microscope works. And now this is great for taking images of thin samples. Um, here's two examples here. The one on the right is just uh, an endothelial cell, stained for microtubules in green and actin in red. And then the one on the left here, this is a really thin section of mouse kidney tissue. I think it's only about 15 microns. Maybe a little bit. Um, but what you can see is these images look pretty good, but there still seems to be a little bit of an inherent blurriness there. Right? It's not as sharp as it could be. It's not as sharp as what I've shown you now on the other half of those images. Okay? So these are um, a couple of images that I took in the facility. One's on our Elyra microscope in, super, or in structured illumination mode, super resolution structured illumination. This is, um, actually I think this was on the old cell observer that we used to have that has an apatone, uh, which is sometimes called three confocal. It's also called structure illumination, which makes this incredibly confusing. Um, but these are two techniques to do optical sectioning through your sample. And what they're doing is removing all the out of focus light. And we're just looking now at an even thinner plane than our actual sample. And you can see that you start to see a lot more detail. So you can start to see these red blood cells really easily. But there's probably some of them right there, and you just can't make them out um, when you're looking at it in wide field. So whenever we start looking at fluorescence in thicker samples, optical sectioning is very important. This is how we're going to get our sharpest, clearest view 
the sample. Right. And so these are the disadvantages of a wide field microscope that we always have to live with. So I told you we take our excitation light, we focus it at the back focal plane of the objective, so we get this collimated beam of excitation light coming out of our objective. It's going to excite these fluorophores on our focal plane here. It's also going to excite any fluorophores above or below that. So we're going to get this mess of excitation light coming back into our um, back to our detector. So the disadvantages to a wide field microscope are that we get light from all focal planes coming back to our detectors, so our image looks blurry. We're exposing that entire sample to light from top to bottom. So we're doing some bleaching. If you're doing a Z stack through that sample, you're bleaching everything, even though you're not, you're only looking at one focal plane. And this leads to a very limited imaging depth. So you can't image that deep into a sample um, in this wide field. Okay. So our question is, how are we going to isolate the light from just a single focal plane? And I wanted to show you this. This is actually drawn to scale. Okay. So if you have a 50 micron tissue section, which is actually pretty thick for a tissue section, um, there's how thick that is. Here's how thick your cover slip is. So your cover slip should be 170 microns. If it's not, you should change cover slips. Um, and then if we use the really high numerical aperture um, objective, it would have a Z depth of field or resolution of about half a micron, okay? So about that. So this is our single Z slice through that tissue section. But in a wide field microscope, we've got fluorescence coming from that entire 15 microns. So we need a method to just get the light from that very thin section back to our detector and not from everywhere else. So the first person who figured out how to do this was Marvin Minsky. This was in the 1950s at MIT, and this is his patent drawing. Uh, he's actually not really well known for this. He was actually big into artificial intelligence, um, which is also really interesting. He's way ahead of his time. Um, but this was his patent application for a confocal microscope. And the way this works is there's a light source here that sends some light into your sample. There's a lens, an objective, that focuses on to your sample. And then um, he wasn't dealing with fluorescence. Obviously, this was a little before that time. Um, but his light would bounce off the sample. He had some reflective sample. He takes some of that reflective light bounce it off this optical component down this way. And then this is the important component of his microscope. So this is a, a little pinhole, okay? So it be as simple as a piece of cardboard with a little bit of a hole in it, and then it went down to his detector. So this pinhole is magical in that it filters out all of the light that's coming from above or below the focal plane or focal point of this objective. So I'll show you that a little bit better in this diagram. So in this diagram, we have a lens that's collecting our light coming from our sample. Okay? And what we have is this solid black line here is our actual focal plane. And the sort of blue cone of light is light coming from a point on that focal plane. Okay? The dotted line here is a focal point deeper into the sample, and the red dotted lines and the red cone is light coming from that point, okay? So what we want is we want this blue light to get back to our detector and we want to get rid of the red light, okay? So if we trace this back, it comes back to our objective, it gets through our beam splitter or dichroic mirror, and it comes back to this pinhole. And this pinhole is positioned exactly where this light should be focused and so the light coming from our focal plane should be focused. You can see it doesn't occupy very much space, so that pinhole can be really small, and that light's going to pass right through. Right? But the red light that's coming from deeper in our sample, it gets focused in front of that pinhole, and now you see that most of it ends up smashing into the pinhole and never makes it back to our detector. Right? So this is how that pinhole picks out just the light from our focal plane. And the same thing would happen 
happen if we were looking on this side. That light would um, be wanting to focus on this side of the pinhole, so most of it would just run into the pinhole and be blocked from being through. Okay. Cool. So what does this look like in our fluorescence microscope now? So this is fully drawn, and not totally to scale, but it will hopefully get the point across. So now what I've done is I've put our pinhole in here. And we're going to do things a little bit different with our excitation light path, OK? So in a confocal microscope, we don't try to excite all of our fluorophores at once or an entire sample plane at once. We just try to image one pixel at a time, OK? So to do that, we take our excitation light, and instead of focusing it into the back focal plane of the objective, we just fill the entire back focal plane of the objective with light, OK? So this is collimated light that's coming into the back focal plane of our objective. That means that our objective will actually focus that light to a point. So now instead of having collimated light coming out of our objective, we've got light that's being focused to a point. Okay? Um, so it focuses to a point at our sample plane that's going to diverge on the other side. Okay. Um, so at that point there, we're going to have a little molecule of GFP. And what I've shown you is one on either side here as well. And so all of the fluorophores that are sort of in that line are all going to get excited, um, but nothing out to the sides here as well. Okay. And if we trace our light from the fluorophore, the GFP molecule, that's right at the sample plane, that's the solid line, and the one that's a little bit closer here, which is the dotted line, you can see when we get back to our pinhole, just like on the slide I showed you earlier, the solid lines get through the pinhole, the dotted lines get blocked, and we only get light from that one. <coughs> Okay. So the biggest keys here are this pinhole detector and then the difference in our excitation light path where we focus it to a point instead of having a collimated beam coming into our okay. So because we only have uh, <coughs> one pixel that's excited at a time, what we're going to do is we're going to take that laser beam and we're going to scan it back and forth, back and forth across our sample. This is done by putting two little mirrors in our microscope that tilt the angle of the light coming into the back of the objective, which means its position in space um, in our sample. So we're going to just scan back and forth, back and forth, image our sample one pixel at a time. Right? And so this is what's going on inside of one of these in our facility. Okay? So we have a bunch of lasers that come into the scan head. There's two mirrors there move back and forth to scan the laser back and forth across your sample. The fluorescence comes back in here, goes through a pinhole, and then goes through the detector. Right. So this is what we call uh, a point scanning confocal microscope. It's definitely the workhorse in the facility. I think six of our 13 microscopes are point scanning confocals. Um, and it has a lot of great advantages to it. But unfortunately, there's still some disadvantages to it, too. So the big advantage is we now have optical suctioning. So we're only looking at light coming from one focal plane. But we're still shining our excitation light all the way through our sample. So if you're doing a really big Z stack, by the time you get to that last focal plane, it's been hit with a lot of light. So it's possible that you bleach out some of that, um, that focal plane before you get to it. We still have uh, a limited imaging depth. Um, this is due to scattering of light, so what we talked about during the tissue clearing uh, sessions earlier this summer. And then because we're only scanning one pixel at a time, this is really slow. Uh, and that's probably the, the biggest disadvantage of a point scanning confocal is that it's slow. So if you have a live sample, something that's really dynamic, this isn't the greatest microscope for imaging those. Okay. So there's been a couple um, advances that, that have tried to get around some of these limitations of the point scanning confocal. And one of those is the spinning disk microscope. So in our spinning disk microscope, what we do is we send in our laser light, and we send it in in a collimated beam, and we have it pass through these two spinning disks, very aptly named. So the first disk is just an array of little micro lenses. And what these are trying to do is collect as much of this laser light as possible and focus it so that it passes through these little tiny pinholes down below on the second disk. Okay? So 
first generation of these didn't have these guys, and so you wasted a lot of laser light. This now um, improves your delivery of laser light to your sample. Okay. So we have the dichroic mirror here. Our excitation light passes through it, and then it goes through these little pinholes here. And what those do, you can kind of think of this as shooting multiple little laser beams at your sample <coughs> all at once. Okay. So now instead of imaging one pixel at a time, you can image multiple pixels at a time. And once this disk does an entire rotation, an entire 360 degrees around, you have hit your entire field of view with excitation light, with one of these little tiny laser beams. Okay? And we can spin this disk really, really fast. Um, so it's fractions of a second to cover your entire sample. Okay? And so each one of those pinholes, when your light comes down, it gets focused onto your sample, the fluorescence comes back up, hits this dichroic mirror, and goes over to your detector. I didn't talk about the detector on the point scanning confocals. Um, it's not a camera. It just has to detect a single pixel at a time, so it's just a single light sensor. But here, we shoot everything back onto a CCD camera. Okay. And so by the time this goes around a couple times, all of that light is integrated onto our camera in our single exposure, and we have an image of our sample. So this ends up being much, much faster. Um, like I said, you only need one rotation, which can do, be done in a fraction of a second, uh, whereas a uh, point scanning confocal can take much longer. So um, again, we've now got optical sectioning, so we're only getting light from a single focal plane. Uh, unfortunately, we're still shooting our laser light all the way through our samples. We still have some issues with machine. We still have limited energy depth. But this is really nice and fast, which is great. The other disadvantage to uh, spinning this is the light coming back from your sample, it doesn't always perfectly hit one of these little pinholes. Sometimes that light gets scattered and it can get into a different pinhole, and then that increases the blur in your sample. So that's why if you're trying to do a direct comparison of spinning this to a point scanning confocal, sometimes you'll see your image is a little blurrier in the spinning disc, not quite as crisp and sharp as a point scanner, but way faster. Cool. So another option that we have is, is two photon microscopy, which you've probably heard of as well. So if we go back to our GFP, as told you before, what we usually send in our cyan light or blue light and we get a green light out. There's another little trick that we can do here. If instead of sending in cyan light, we send in red light, and two photons of red light hit that chromophore at exactly the same time, those two photons of red light have the same amount of energy as that photon of blue light. And so we can still get the same increase um, in energy levels in our chromophore, and then we can shoot out a green photon. So the end result is the same. We're getting green photons out. The only difference is our excitation. It's two photons of red light coming in. Right. And when we do this in a two photon microscope, what's really interesting is obviously the probability of two photons hitting your chromophore at the same time is really, really low. The the only point where there's a high enough probability of this happening is at the focal point of your objective. That's the only spot into your entire light path where you can concentrate photons at a high enough density to ensure that you get two photons hitting your molecule die at once. All right? So this is a little experiment. This is such a cool image. I really need to do this sometime in the facility. Um, but what we have here is just a little cube that's filled with, uh, I believe it's Fit C, which is a green fluorescent dye. And this is using one photon excitation. So this is just shining in cyan light. So you can see there's a little bit of blue light reflecting here back up. That's what's going into the cuvette. And we're getting excitation of that dye in here. So you can see our light coming in, focusing, and then diverging. Okay? And we're getting excitation of the dye all the way from the top to the bottom of the cuvette. If instead we put in red light, it's tough to see. But there's one little spot of excitation there. Okay? So you no longer have this big hourglass shape of excitation. You just have one tiny little spot in the middle. Because that's the only point in that entire optical system where the photons are concentrated enough to get two of them hitting your fluorophore at the same time. 
So what this means is in our two photon microscope setup, our excitation is still the same, except we're using red light instead of cyan. So it's going to come in, it's going to bounce off this dichroic mirror. I said this dichroic mirror is inverted. And what I mean by that is this one's going to reflect red light, look like green light through, um, as opposed to the cyan green, which is the opposite before. So our red's going to bounce in. We're going to get that two photon excitation process only at our focal plane. And what that means is that pinhole is now useless. So we don't need that pinhole anymore because only this fluorophore at the focal plane and not the one above or below are being excited. Right. So we can actually get rid of that pinhole. And what this means is we can now be a little more efficient in our collection of uh, photons. So now, we still have optical sectioning. We only have light coming from one focal plane. We don't have to worry about bleaching inside of our focal plane anymore. So if you're gathering a big, huge ZSAC, you're not bleaching your sample above or below there. Um, so this is a huge advantage of two photon. The other thing is we now have this much larger imaging depth. And that's for two reasons. Um, if you look at tissue, so this is just shining a flashlight through your hand. So it's white light that's coming out of the flashlight. But we only see red light here. And the reason for that is um, tissue has a lot of heme in it, and heme absorbs all of your blue and green light. So you only get the red light passing through. So if we use red light for excitation, we can get our excitation light a lot deeper into our sample. Okay. The other thing is, I told you we're not using that pinhole anymore, so we're being more efficient in the light that we're gathering. So this also lets us gather the green fluorescence that's coming from deeper in our sample. We can do a more uh, efficient job of collecting that. So those two things can um, combine, give us this much larger imaging depth with two photon. Okay? But we're back to a point scanning process, so this is really slow. So there's one last optical section technique that I want to talk to you about. And that's light sheet. So in light sheet, we do things a little bit differently. Instead of using the exact same objective to send in our excitation light and collect our fluorescence, we're using two different objectives. And we arrange them perpendicular to one another. So these block objectives on the sides here, these are what are projecting in our excitation light. Okay. So here's our blue excitation light that's coming in. We've got a sample sitting in this little um, agros column here that has some GFP in it that gets excited, and that fluorescence goes back out into um, our collection objective at the back. Our light is shaped a lot differently here, so instead of focusing this light or sending it in as a column of light, we're actually sending it in as a really thin sheet. Okay? So what that means is that we can move the sample back and forth through that sheet. That sheet is much, much thinner than our sample. And we're only exciting one plane at a time. So we sort of step that sample through. The entire focal plane is excited at the same time. And we just snap an image really quick. Okay. So what this means is we now have optical sectioning. So we only have light coming from where that light sheet is. Depending on what objective you're using, um, it's only coming from the focal plane or it's mostly coming from the focal plane. So if you have a really high resolution objective, you're still getting some out of focus light because we just can't make the light sheet that thin. Um, on the particular system that we have, uh, if you've heard of lattice light sheet or vessel beam light sheets, they can make a much thinner light sheet and then you always only have light coming from your focal plane. Um, we don't have any bleaching outside of our focal plane. We now have a pretty large imaging depth, um, and that comes more from our ability to rotate our sample. But the key thing here is that this is really, really fast. Um, so we can fly through a sample very, very quickly and image the entire thing. How fast is that? So fast is like 10 frames a second is easily done. You can even do more than that if you want to crop your field of view a little bit. But usually we run at a between 7 and 10 
Yeah. So I'm wondering how like two photon or the previous confocal deals with changes in reflective index because of the tissue sample as the light passes through it. Yeah, so um, some of your scattering in tissue is wavelength dependent, some of it is not. Um, so usually most of the scatter that we deal with in biological tissue is due to lipid, and that's wavelength independent. So it's not going to matter too much. But the wavelength dependent scattering is going to be a lot less if you're using an infrared laser. Um, to excite your sample than if you're using blue light. Um, so from that aspect, you reduce a bit of the scatter, but for the most part, most of the scatter that's being done there is still going to be there unless you do a tissue cutting process. Um, yeah, so the, the two photon process just lets you get your excitation light in deeper and be more efficient on the photon that you're collecting. So what happens with the traditional point scanning confocal is if you have a GFP molecule deep in your sample, sorry, not even deep in your sample, but on your focal plane, when that light from that GFP comes, if it gets scattered anywhere in the way out, it's going to hit your pinhole. So what you actually get in your detector on a point scanning confocal is the light from your focal plane minus what's scattered on its way out. But with two photon, because we can get rid of that pinhole, and we, it doesn't, we know where it came from, so it doesn't matter if it bounces 10 times on the way out as long as it gets to our detector when you want to keep it full. Um, so that's the, the biggest advantage there. All right, so just to summarize, this was a, a great diagram out of a review paper a couple years ago. Um, it basically shows what we've been talking about. So on the left here, we have our wide field microscope. So we have our illumination light that comes in. We focus it at the back focal plane of the objective so that we get this collimated beam of light that illuminates our entire focal plane and all the way through our sample. So they've got three little molecules of fluorescence here that are getting focused back onto the camera. But they've also got this one that's, that's drawn by these magenta lines that's sitting a little bit higher. And you can see that when that gets back to the camera here, it's not completely focused. And so it's actually just showing a big blurry spot that's happening on your camera, okay? So that's the type of light that interferes with you from being able to see the, the nice sharp image of your sample plane, okay? So the next one over here, this is a point scanning confocal. So our illumination light is coming in. It's not being focused at the back focal plane anymore. It's um, collimated there so that when it comes out of the objective, then it gets focused into our sample. And they're showing this hourglass shape of excitation light moving in this direction. And uh, same thing here. We've got these dark green lines that are coming from our focal plane. They pass through the pinhole and get to the detector. Whereas the magenta ones coming from a little higher here, they aren't focused yet. They just smash into the pinhole and don't get to our detector. Okay? So that's how we get optical sectioning there. Light sheet. We're sending in our excitation light from the side here, forming this nice thin sheet through our sample that's only exciting those three molecules there. They all come back and get focused nicely onto our camera. And then we can just move the sample up and down really quickly and build up that 3D image that way. Okay. Cool. Excellent. So, we covered a lot. We didn't cover everything. But I think these are sort of the important points, the basics that I'd really <coughs> like people to know. Um, and obviously, if you have more questions, feel free to come. Talk to Aaron, Christian, or I. We love talking about this stuff. Um, and obviously, feel free to ask some more questions today. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll see you in a couple more weeks.